Hello, people. Here we go again. The weekly Wednesday live Q&A. So, factory versus luthier. It's a big topic. And we're going to talk about if there is such a difference or differences that matter from the perspective of the guitar player. And this cannot possibly be covered in one uh, YouTube live stream or, I don't know, should write a book about it or a series of books. But for starters, I decided to interview or, or have a few conversations with experienced prof professionals from different facets of our beloved guitar business. And here we go. So I am Juha Rokangas, your humble servant, on a mission from the gods of fretted instruments, whoever they may be. Hmm, and now actually, that I think of it, I have one of them here with me today. Let me introduce to you. Well, he's not here. He's in Toronto. Let me let me show you who I'm talking about. Hey, great. Hi, you have. <laughs> there you nice are. To be here. We're like yeah. we're actually we're actually high fiving there a moment ago. I think. Oh uh, yeah. Yeah. Hey. Uh, <laughs> Something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know which way to do it. You can't see the live stream. You just see my face. But so we're next to each other here on the live stream. And anyways. So people, let me introduce introduce you to one of the gods of fretted instruments. <laughs> you know, please give a warm welcome to Sir William Grit Laskin. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I'm not kidding about with that Sir title. It's real. You know, I've served thee, my lord. <laughs> you Bless know. you, my son. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Thank you, Grit. Grit, Grit is, in fact... A recipient of the highest civilian honor, the Order of Canada, which is equivalent to, to knighting this, the Sir title in England. So a master luthier of the highest order, in other words. So, Grit, you've been making guitars for your living since 1971. Isn't that correct? Correct. Yes. It is correct, yeah. Yeah. And so I was born in 1972, by the way. Oh. <laughs> which which means... <laughs> which means that when you started carving your first guitars, I was merely a twinkle in the corner of my father's eyes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, and, and you started making guitars at, at Jean Larivet's shop in Toronto. Isn't that Yes, right? that's right. As, a, yep. as an apprentice, yep. yes. Yep, I worked with him for two years yeah. and then uh, my own shop since then. Yeah. And, and people, you can find um, information about Grit from his website and from various sources. So let's not go too deep on that. But I want to I wanna ask you one thing. Grit, why on earth did you become a guitar maker? What, what were you thinking? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, well uh, obviously, that's, my parents were asking the same question. Oh, mine too. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure you do. Although, like most parents... I bet once you're successful in any creative field, they move from being anxious for you as their child. Will they make a living? Will they pay the rent? To being excited about you because you're exactly. successful and now they can't stop talking about you to all their friends, right? <laughs> yeah. I'm sure it's the same for you. So to answer your question, I was a guitar player since I was nine years old. Mm -hmm. So always loved the instrument that way. And I loved woodworking but never did a lot of it. My father didn't do it. He wasn't one of those hobby woodworker dads. Um, and at summer camp was about the only time I could play in the wood shop, but yeah. I just loved everything. I loved the tactile feel. I loved the smells. And I remembered back, even when I was a, a little kid, like when I was maybe five or six years old and there was a yeah. carpenter building a carport over our driveway. Yeah. And I would go out and play with my little play toolbox and a lump of wood on the, on the walk while he was working. And I remember telling him, when I grow up, I'm going to be a carpenter. Yeah. And I was six years old. Yeah. So there you go. Okay. So it was the music, playing guitar, and the woodworking, the appeal of that together. I just got excited when I yeah. realized it was a possible route to a yeah. living as an adult. And when did, when did this connection with actually making the guitar... Do you have a recollection of that 
moment um, or time time of your life or yeah i do well i was 17 i uh, i came to toronto as a teenager on my own and uh i was i had seen an article about some instrument makers out on the West Coast yeah. in a in a big publication, and I, you know, and the naive teenager that I was, I thought, well, one day I'll just hitchhike out to the West Coast, show up at their door, knock on their door, and say, hey, I'd like to be an apprentice, right? That's what was my plan, yeah. right? Yeah, typical teenager. Yeah, uh, and then I saw an early guitar made by John Larrave yeah. at a music store in Toronto. And I remember holding it, and they told me this was handmade by a guy right here. And I looked at it, and I was baffled. All I knew about, you know, and I'm in the acoustic side of things yes. mostly, yes. right? Mm -hmm. I think Martins, Gibsons, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Everybody wanted a Martin. You know, you yeah. had to have a Martin. Yeah. And I even owned one at one point. But uh, I thought, handmade, and I looked at all the joints, and they were perfect. And I thought, how does... How does a human being create something like this? How is that possible? Because I had no <laughs> professional experience on how you, yeah. how you even glued two pieces of wood together and did it well. I, I yeah. had no idea how that was accomplished. So next thing I know, I'm hanging out at the Mariposa Folk Festival, which happened on the islands just off the coast of Toronto. And there was John Larrave showing his work at a, in the craft area yeah. for the first time. Mm -hmm. And I saw him and I told him I'd seen this guitar and uh, and I just spontaneously said, would you ever take on an apprentice? And that's another story for another time yeah. of why. But yeah. he actually said, OK, come on along in the fall when I start wow. up again in, in the years before he owned yeah. climate control equipment. So no, no bluing in the humid weather. Yeah. And I did. And that was the start of it. Yeah. That's fascinating. I, I, you've told me, um, well, Grit and I know, know each other from years and years ago. And so we, we've met at various occasions at guitar shows and become friends and, and, and all that. Not, let's not go into that either, but there's so much fascinating stories. And I know that if I would just unleash you, you know, the hour would be gone and, yeah. you know. <laughs> I think our audience would be gone after the third hour. It's possible. There but, is, uh, there is know, actually. Uh, you and I, yeah. Oh, sorry. Go, go, go. You and I both love what we do. We're passionate about it. Yeah. We we love the details. So yes. of course, there's lots to talk about because this is our world. Right? I know, I know. Like I'm like I'm always saying to you know when people somebody asks me about the you know the choice of becoming when did you choose becoming a guitar maker. It kind of feels like when that opportunity showed itself in a bit similar way as to you when 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 you saw that Jean Larivet's guitar and kind of it it dawned to you that somebody makes these by hand. And I had a similar yeah. experience. Let's not go into that now, but I feel that it's almost like there was no choice. It was like it sucked me in from that moment on. Like the guitar making chose me. I didn't choose it. That's the way I've kind yeah. of experienced it. Interesting, interesting, Yuha. And you know, sort of relating to it in a way, I do remember that for the couple of years I spent with John, and mm -hmm. for most of those years it was just he and I. He was still pretty small. Nobody mm -hmm. else, even other people who came soon after and worked with him, no one had that one on one experience. I was yeah. so lucky. Yeah. But I remember I was high for two years non-stop <laughs> which is, that's not even healthy you know that's yeah. insane yeah but, but i was so excited learning guitars i was uh, starting to hang around at a music club and became part of the house band i was picking up new instruments yeah. so it was just learning exciting new 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 i was just that was just a wonderful time yeah absolutely wonderful. i can i can i can imagine and and i'm happy for you and people um, okay, enthusiasm. Check, you know, yeah. that's that's enthusiasm, right? So, um, okay, in addition to being a guitar maker, um, your how would I describe it? Your ace up the sleeve <laughs> or something, your um, 
superhero power is your absolutely uh -oh. unique inlay art, your ing engraved inlay art. And Grit, I've chosen one, one guitar from, from your book, from the book Grand Complications. Um, okay. I'd like to, I will show a few photos to the viewers. You're not going to see the photos. They're, they're close-ups that I just snapped with my phone from your book of that guitar. So I'm going to show those close-ups. And while I'm showing those close-ups, you could tell, you could tell, um, tell us a little bit about this guitar. Guess which, which guitar is it? Well, I need to see. <laughs> <laughs> but I but have no, chosen. I which guitar have I chosen? <laughs> Don't you know me well enough to tell? No, no, not not. There, there's nothing, nothing deep as that. Okay, I will give you a hint. The book title. Oh, okay. Grand complications. <laughs> the grand, yes. grand complications. Okay, so so you know, so we can't dive all the way into the fascinating story of this guitar. But, you know, I will I will show those pictures and you, you have, I don't know, five minutes or something like that okay. to tell a short version of that, that guitar, the grand complications, and I'll dig a guitar. But before that, I forgot to show this okay. to the people. I'm gonna show this other picture first. This is you, people are now seeing a picture of you sitting on the floor. We were just talking about Jay's shop. So I believe it's oh, you okay. sitting there on the shop, black and white image. You're covered in what I, it looks to me like a, a rosewood shavings or something like that. And, is, and you're yeah. holding, you're holding a guitar bridge in your hand. And yeah, uh, yeah. it appears like, I don't know, you've, you've dug into that piece of rosewood and found that bridge inside the piece of rosewood. <laughs> And that was I. That was my first year of apprentice with John. I was 18, wow. planer, a thickness planer, yeah. and we had been, you know, leveling some boards. And there was this huge pile of rosewood shavings, <laughs> and we thought, oh, won't it be fun? Let's pretend. Okay, so they took. There's actually a series of three photos. Okay. The first one, with a, another board of rosewood, a complete board sitting on my on my lap as I'm on the mm. floor. Then you see me with a knife going after the board, you know, just a hand <laughs> knife. And the third picture is the pile of shavings with a tiny little classical guitar bridge yeah. after this board that had been <laughs> yeah. sitting on the floor. And now we were just, I don't know, we were in a silly mood. Yeah. And that's the only photo I have of the series. I yeah. was 18 years old. Yeah. So that was a long time ago. But you could, I, you know, you're the same guy. I can tell. People can tell. Yeah. So, okay. I had more moving hair. on. Moving on. Now we're moving on to the Grand Complications guitar, and I'm going to show you, yes. the, show people the uh, the picture of. Now they're seeing the inlay, the 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 whole fretboard and the headstock. So, great. Okay. Go. All right. So Grand Complications, which I used as the title one for the book, uh, was built for somebody who wanted me to explore the history of high end watches. And you know my watch, uh, my watch costs you know 150 bucks. That's that's my level. About the know? same as my watch. And, yeah. Yeah, and I had no idea that this whole world was out there of people who will pay six figures for these high-end mechanical watches. Yeah. That and it's the, in the intense engineering that goes into them to create many what they call complications. In other words, it can do many different functions all within this tiny little piece of engineering. It's really Some of these companies will put a glass front or back on it so that you can admire all their incredible work inside. Yeah. So anyway, I had to pour myself into this world and I realized that probably the, the man who needs celebrating the most, yes, I remember that drawing, uh, the, was uh, Breguet, a watchmaker who I think, was he French or Swiss? I'm blanking out now. I forget. It's been a few years. And uh, Breguet was the man who invented a method for making watches almost dead on accurate for the first time in their history. Up till him, they were pretty inaccurate. Mostly they were pocket watches that would sit 
you know, upright, like hanging from your neck or from a chain. And what would happen is the mechanisms inside, as they cycled around, when they moved southward, they would move faster because of gravity. And when they're moving northward, they would move slower. Yeah. So this movement would become inaccurate as it circled. Well, he created a way for the movements to do their circles very quickly, very rapidly. And it was called tourbillon, like yes. the French word for, you know, whirlwind. whirlwind yes. Because it was moving so fast, it negated 99% of the effect of gravity. gravity yeah. And it made the watches accurate, or very accurate, yeah. for the first time in yeah. history. A revolutionary. This was the late yeah. Revolutionary. Yes. To this day... A tourbillon movement is at the core of all high-end watches. Exactly. Yes. Still to this day, mm -hmm. after more than 200 years since this was created it's by the, the, the Breguet. Es the, so, es the escapement mechanism of the tourbillon. Good for you. Yes. Thank you for remembering that. Yeah. When I was working on that inlay design, I had all the jargon in my head, but it's been years. And, it, <laughs> and by the way, you know, by the way you're, you're correct. He is... He's sort of both French and from Switzerland because he's from France, but the company moved to Switzerland later on. So you're right and you're right. Uh, that, thank you. <laughs> so that's what that inlay was about, really celebrating high-end watches and Breguet and the tourbillon movement and all of that. And I have forgotten to show the details. Okay, we have the headstock now here. Okay. The headstock and yeah, we and have... Yeah, and headstock, you're seeing, you're seeing the face of one of Breguet's <clears throat> actual watches with him uh engraved in it and i'm there because the owner of the guitar said you know grit i want your face in there somewhere so we decided to use uh, a moon phase movement which yeah. is sometimes a complication built in, in, in the watches, and my yeah. face became, became the moon face <laughs> yeah. and you can see my eyes looking at Breguet. like i think i mm -hmm. have my eyes looking upward yeah okay i'm gonna just scroll through the fretboard now we have here a blue okay. blue woman from yep. Art Deco, correct? Art Deco yep. nude figures and inspired. And th and that was because the owner himself, that was another passion of him, Art Deco objet. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it would be lamps or wall sconces, and they were often nude figures holding the light or doing things yeah. like that. And uh, so that's why the two women are in sort of weird colors. To, to tell you that they're not real, yeah, that they are magical people right. playing roles as if they were part of the watch mechanism. Yeah, at least that's in my head. That's what was going on. Yeah, this is people. Those of you who are not um, familiar with Grit's work, this is the way. This is the every guitar he makes with these wonderful. The way he uh, describes. Um, using the, the the fretboard and the headstock as the canvas as the the canvas for his engraved inlay art so every guitar is a is a story or or a multiple layers of stories entwining together and there it's very fascinating so if i didn't say it already you should buy this book go buy <laughs> it immediately don't go buy it immediately after the broadcast go buy it from amazon or is it still is yes. it sold out or is it available Oh, it no, it's still available. available. Yeah, yeah, great. So by the book, it's it's a must-have for any um, guitar enthusiast. Or Okay. Yeah, I, I feel, I feel. So there we have some more close-ups. We're going to just scroll through. Wait a minute, what is here? There's more. Yeah, and then there is the, you mentioned that, that sometimes wristwatches have the back, back of the watches also see through mm -hmm. so you can you can admire the the movement and the escapement mechanism there clicking back and forth clicking back and forth and correctly yeah. to the idea you've also placed the back of the guitar to the back of the headstock of your guitar and and depict yeah. this yeah. there yeah and you can see this particular movement was made as you've told the story the whole story to me at, at another time these watches were made 50 pieces and so your inlay inlaid watch is the number 51 
of the series. Yes. So, of, <laughs> number 51 of, of a series of 50. <laughs> so That's right. Yeah. And, and, and some of that, it was partly for fun, but also because the owner was worried about any of these watch companies uh, suing him or, you know, for using their, their logo or something like yeah. that. So we, we thought this will cover us. Yeah. Now, it's obvious, <laughs> not the real thing. Okay, people, now you know a little bit. Now you know a little bit. So let's tie this to our topic for today. So factory versus luthier. It's pretty obvious yeah. that this guy here sitting next to me, um, you know, this is nothing even reminiscent of, of what factories are about and of factory made guitars are about. So there is, it's a world, it's a different planet. And, and this is deliberate from my side because this is going to be a series of interviews. So it's going to be different people from different facets of the industry, if you want to call it industry, maybe maybe I like, maybe Grit likes to call it more like a lifestyle or career, life, life's work. But, um, but anyways, um, so I wanted to interview Grit for a number of reasons. He's, he's, he's my teacher for engraved, art, uh, engraved inlay and, and I'm so, so grateful still for, for the teachings. I, my, before your magic powder, <clears throat> my engravings looked like I don't know what they looked like like s scraped <laughs> lights on the yeah. face of anyway not going deeper into that but but yeah so grit grit's world exists in the in the one end of the spectrum of what guitar making can be I I feel it's it's at the same time which is also fascinating to me is that that the better I've learned to know Grit and and learned about his guitars, um, I feel that despite the fact that your your you the, the, the art the the engraved inlay is so crucial part of your 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 instruments, to me it still feels always when talking to you when reading about and when it still feels like. Despite of all that, you're still not looking at the guitar as an as a as an primarily as an art object. It's it's still a tool. It's a musical instrument. Is this correct? Yeah. Like I'm. Thinking. Abs absolutely, Yuha, and I, I say it all the time, even in writing, that it's a it's a tool first. Yeah. It has to sound good, play well, do its job for the musician for their creative pursuit. And only after that can we look at the other aspects. Yeah. So my clients, my customers feel they're getting a working piece of art, yeah. something very personal yeah. to them. You know, all the inlay, I don't repeat the art ever. And I'm usually pulling a theme from, from the customer. Yeah. So they're connected to it that way. But it must be an excellent tool first. I yeah. mean, that's the way it should be anyway. But even especially for me, or I would be dismissed as somebody who just deals with the surface of things, all the inlay art. The last thing I want is people to say, oh yeah, Grits guitars are gorgeous. Get one and put it on the wall. But if you really want a good one to play, go buy a, buy a Taylor or a Collins, you know? Can't have them saying that. So thankfully, most of my customers, you know, I blow them away with the sound, which is my job number one. It's got to play as easily as they need and want, and it's got to deliver all the sound and more that they are asking for. Yeah. And and thankfully, you know, knock on some wood. There's got to be some wood around here somewhere. Uh, here. I do. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> knock on this wood. That's right. Uh, so yeah, I appreciate that, but it's critical that it's the excellent tool first. Yeah. Listen, great. We have a we have a good question here for someone. In the okay. in the in the chat, because people are actually able to to send the chat messages during our our discussion. So, Temu from okay. Finland is asking: Is it a factory if CNC machinery is used? <laughs> is it a factory? Ha, <laughs> that's interesting. Uh, do you want me to start? Yes. Okay. Go ahead. All right. I'm, I'm good. Before I I directly answer that question. 
I've been thinking about this topic ever since you invited me to participate. And I think one thing that's important to say is what is handmade? What does yes. that really mean? Exactly. And I think this question points to it. Yeah. And in my mind, handmade doesn't mean you did everything with a hand tool. It means in candlelight, in candlelight. <laughs> yeah, or and in candlelight, that's right. Uh, it isn't that at all. To me, it's one brain making all the decisions, sifting all the data and all the information that's happened up to this stage in the construction. You remember everything you've done about thicknessing and wood materials and dimensions and, and how you treated everything. And you are constantly thinking of the guitar holistically. Yes. You're thinking of every single aspect of it every time. And you're bringing that collective thought to every decision you make subsequent to that. Yes. That is the definition of handmade. One brain in control of everything. And exactly. a, a way to contrast it is, imagine a, a, a big production line, yeah. you know, at a major factory. Mm. Well, you know, woman 19 sands a little thin. She's doing her job. She sands, she's supposed to be sanding the backs, but she sanded a little too thin. But that back carries on into the process. And then guy 81 doesn't notice that it's thinner or has no way of checking. Yeah, he just exactly. does his routine the way he always does. Yeah. And so what do you end up with? You, you've lost the ability to be in control of the consistency of the sound. Yeah. That's why from a manufacturer, you'll get a bell curve of results every time. So if people want a tailor or a, you know, or, 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 or um, a Fender or a Gibson or a Martin, I say, look, You're going to have to go to five or six different stores, play a bunch of them, find the one that's excellent and that really speaks to you. That's the bell curve. It's, it's... Okay, I can't really see it on my screen, okay. but uh, I trust it. But basically, it's I mean, curve. you're going to get a, a whole bunch that are excellent and a bunch that are crappy and then a whole bunch in the middle that are just okay. Yeah. And that's what happens in manufacturing, whereas for people like you and me, where it's essentially handmade, whether it's small shop or solo luthier, mm. you're in control and it's our task to produce something excellent every time yeah. or we will lose our waiting list of orders. Yeah, exactly. So it's it's you've already said, I think everything and more I was maybe trying to say in a more clumsy way but <laughs> but i'll just add that um yeah because you're 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 making it all yourself alone you're a one-man shop correct yes yeah. and and in our case um we are five people but with exactly these priorities and this philosophy behind it Even if we are five people, we're all guitar makers, and we we um, we don't do serial production of any kind for this purpose. So it's one man making a guitar from the beginning to the end. It's also it's it's for for the for the reason of being able to control every guitar, and it's also for the reason that that's the way it can remain fun from year after year after year and decade after decade for the person making it. And so the motivation is high, and mm. you know that you you get the the you get the whole works. You get to play the guitar, and it's easy to po for me, who runs the business, to point <laughs> if somebody <laughs> makes a mistake. Hey, you made this guitar, <laughs> or I yeah. made this guitar. If yeah. there's a mistake, well, anyway. So yes, that's this is this is very very good points. Um, defining some of so, the differences. Uh, yeah. Okay. El, you, I'll jump in and answer the question that came over. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, mm. Over the the question. And and so to me, uh, whether it's a CNC machine or you're using routers mm. or whatever you're using, your thickness sanding, uh, to me it, it's irrelevant. Exactly. You know, if a CNC yeah. machine carves the neck or shapes the bridge. So what? Yeah, it does. That's not that's not playing a role in 
the quality of the instrument yeah. per se. You know, yeah. again, I go back to who is who is overseeing the process yeah. and bringing all that data to each decision. Yeah. That's there, the, o- the only important thing. I, I, I totally agree with the, the um, addition that sometimes a CNC can be um, a tool that that you know it takes the builder it's not every bit as hands on anymore mm. so it can be something that you don't know maybe the materials so well anymore because you don't you're not hands on as much as you used to be so there can be there can be a difference but i think that's more um tied into whether whether um the the builder i think this is even more um more so in the field of electric guitars where i am coming from so i think that that it's more like uh, the the about the the awareness and the conscious decision of of the builder to be aware of that that you know that you don't lose that touch to the your materials that what materials you're working on because sometimes there are are yeah go ahead oh no that's no, okay sorry i didn't mean to interrupt you huh? it's okay. but i i really liked your point and i and I, I get it. And I, I think you're right about that, because even for me, uh, there's lots of parts of building the guitar that I could I could tool up to make it quicker and I could get a bunch more done. But then I would lose that tactile pleasure that I get in in working it by hand. And one of the things we do, I love carving a neck to yeah. me. It's like sculpture. And I love carving the heel and feeling it with my hands for any any unevenness and that's how I judge it I close my eyes and I run my hand up it and I can feel what's going on as well as being in control of any issues of grain movement or things like yeah. that you know that just yeah. affect exactly and, and so and yeah. from another from from another aspect the, about the enjoyment of working with with old fashioned methods for me also drawing is exactly the same way. So when I'm drawing, whether it's artwork, whether it's a guitar, whether it's whatever, and I'm always doing it, you know, with pencil and eraser, my undo button is the, the, the eraser. And there is no scaling possibility (laughs) other than with, with Xerox, with copy machine to make it very extremely clumsy. And I, I can, I can tell that, that, there are a lot of, a lot of people who who are just who would just laugh at it. That why? Because it's so much easier to do it another way. And it's true. I understand that the way I do it is very clumsy, very slow. It's not as effective as it could be, and so on and so forth. But at the same time, I've loved to draw since I was a little kid, and I don't want to mm. lose that. I want to draw because I enjoy doing it. And the, and the fact of like I'm often saying that you know one of the fundamental reasons behind starting to make guitars was that I wouldn't need to go get a job, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, yeah. that I could do instead because uh, getting a job represented for me something that you have to do. That instead of doing something you have to do, I could use my time here, whatever time I'm given to do something I enjoy to do. So, Simple as that kind. Yeah. You know, yeah, I can I I we're on the same wavelength there, you huh? Because even for me, all my inlay designs, yes, I've seen all the CAD programs and stuff, and I've seen what they can do and change dimensions and turn things around and all that wonderful stuff. And I have I appreciate it and understand it, but I too enjoy the tactile satisfaction of just holding a pencil and drawing on paper. And that's all my designs are yeah. just pencil yeah. drawings first. Yeah. So there's yeah. there's a deeper me there's a deeper, whether it's however fancy we want to call it, whether there's a meditational, philosophical, whatever dimension you want to name it. But but for me, it's simple. Just I like to do it more that way, and and I kind of feel that going into the machine world from the get-go from the from the drawing board will will take me to another place and i lose the touch to that little kid you know and i i don't want to do that 
<laughs> yeah. Now yeah. I get it. I'm okay, just... we're moving on. So we're gonna okay. talk about. We hope this this answered your question. Um, who was it again? Well, it was someone I've forgotten the person's name, but he's there. Okay. We have we have yeah. many comments. People are saying hello to you, Grit. You can't see the to see <laughs> the chat, but they are. Everybody's saying hello to Grit. So, yeah. yeah, they should understand that I can't see that. Only you can. Yeah, but that's I, the thing. I yeah. look for. It. So, yeah. hello everyone. I appreciate that. <laughs> that's lovely. So, um, we're gonna moving be moving on, and um, I have this idea. We could, you know, try to calibrate ourselves. We're kind of already on the way there, talking about the meditational, all this stuff, but. We're going to talk about a few pointers that you, Grit, have been, um, in fact, um, author, you have authored already back in the 1980s. I'm talking about the, the code of ethics that, that you, you conjured up. Was it alone that you did this? Or was it, it, was, your, it was your document that you presented at, the, at, a, at a convention or... Can you tell us about uh, yeah. this idea? We're talking about the Association of Stringed Instrument Artisans, ASIA, Asia. And yeah. tell, tell us a little bit about how the idea or the need, how such a concept of code of ethics can come about. Oh, sure. Um, that was while I was president of Asia. I'm one of the founders. Uh, that's one of the two, you know, luthier organizations based in the U.S. And... Um, and we had we had many discussions uh, through various meetings about the problem of people who, you know, some guy, he works on a friend's bass. And next thing you know, he puts out a shingle that he's a guitar repair guy now because he badly refretted somebody's, you know, precision bass or something. And we're going, but that's unfair for people who've spent years honing their craft, working with people, learning, getting really good at what they do and professional. And there isn't a regulating body to confirm one as different from the other. So what do we do? And we thought, should we start a regulating body? And the nightmare of that and the organization to run it would be required. That didn't make sense. So we thought, how about this? What if we, well, it was my suggestion. What about a passive way of encouraging luthiers to be professional. And I suggested uh, this uh, code of ethics, which didn't exist in our field anywhere. And so, yes, I did do the first draft as president, brought it to the board, and we fine-tuned it as a board. And then we presented it at one of the symposiums that Asia mm -hmm. you, still holds pretty much annually or every two years at that time. And um, that was the whole point of it. The idea was, you, as the luthier, would take it, post it in your workshop, or if you're just a repair place where people would come in and see it, and that means your customers would see it posted there, would recognize that you are following these precepts and are willing to display them in public, which tells you, you are now obligated to follow these because you, my customer, are reading them. Yeah. And we felt this was a passive but Brilliant. effective way of somehow, you know, adding to the professionalism of the mm. field. By the, by so, the way, there you go. There. By the by the way, in the meanwhile, I've started to call this code of ethics the six commandments by the God <laughs> by by the grit of fretted instruments. <laughs> so <laughs> that's what I have reading in my in my notes here. The Six Commandments okay. by the Grit of Fretted Instruments. So to the viewers, um, mm -hmm. as you could al already hear, Grit has had and still has a central role as one of the pioneers of the, the it, you could call it the North American Luthier movement from early 1970s and on. And if you want to know more about what such, what such a strange movement is about, there is this book, uh, Guitar Makers, um, by Catherine Dudley, who is um, a professor of, of uh, anthropology at Yale University, and and uh, it's a heavy duty study, a bit difficult English language, me for me, you know, non English, non native English speaker, but maybe for others, I don't know, but but it's it's heavy stuff, and and it's very fascinating, I think. Um, 
really digging deep and also um, commenting a lot and interviewing a lot of people from both sides of the fence, from from L Luthi from the luthier world and from the industry, like the CEO of Martin and Martin Guitars and uh, and Bob Taylor and so on and so forth. So this is an interesting take on that stuff. So we're now going back to that to the to the code of ethics, to the six commandments. Um, so I could I could show you guys so, so you just know what kind of stuff it is. So I'll ch just show a few examples, unless you grit have memorized this, and you can <laughs> cite it no. out of your well, not, <laughs> no. no, no, not totally. Uh, okay. But I do recall it was our conscious effort to make everything positive, as opposed yeah. to saying a negative thing. Ah, it's you will do this, as Great. opposed to you'll never. You know right. Totally, and, uh, totally so mostly sense. that's it. Okay, so I'm going to show you guys. Yeah, sorry. Okay. Yeah. All right. I'm going to show a few of them, and I will read them out loud because this this um, grit you didn't even know it, but this this uh, broadcast is also going to be published as a as a podcast, as the only the audio track will be ah. published to all okay. kinds of podcast platforms okay. that people are using. So, so they're not going to see this. So I'm, I will read it. I will honor my craft by continually striving towards the refinement of my skills, the broadening of my knowledge, the improvement of my services, and when and where it is appropriate, generally, share, general, generously sharing my knowledge with others. This will be one example. Uh, yeah. let's, okay. let's take another one, which I think these are all, I mean, these are all brilliant, but you know, <clears throat> I will compete fairly and honorably with colleagues by not, how do you say that word? Denigrating, De how do you? Denigrating. Denigrating yeah, you their achievements or otherwise interfering with their client relationships. Rather, I will work with them to foster charitable and collegial uh, relationships. So there's another one. Um, I'm gonna bring on a third one. These are all brilliant. Um, I will undertake only those tasks, I think this is the, one of the best ones. I will undertake only those tasks or commissions which are within my level of skill to comp complete. I will not misrepresent or overstate my level of competence. <clears throat> this is brilliant stuff. And yeah. um, okay, and th there is more of those, <clears throat> but there is six of them. And I will leave those now for a little while there for for people who are watching this on YouTube and not listening it um, <clears throat> as a pod, as a podcast. Where is that? Wait a minute. So here's the whole code of ethics, all six of them. I will leave it there for a little while so people can maybe take a screenshot, whatever they want. Um, and in the meanwhile, you know, to me, regardless what your field of work, your walk of life, I mean, this code of ethics sounds like something that can be applied to pretty much anything you do, the way you interact with people and so on. It's like a healthy set of values. And, you know, you know, maybe in the current reality, one addition to the code could be something from the, you know, environmental aspect, something like in the spirit of, I've read somewhere from Native Americans code from a tribe or another, can't remember which one, maybe Hopi Indians, um, enjoy what Mother Earth has to offer, but leave no marks. That could be something that, you know, that let's not, let's use materials sparingly, sparingly and uh, and be good to the Mother Earth in, in every way we can. Yeah. But this, this could be something on a, on a kind of a more... But but it, it's it's more. Uh, I understand that this is more kind of like the about the relationship between the customer and the and the builder, and so. So it's it's yeah. it's really cool stuff. But grit. Now I'm going to remove this from people. This this here, so they can see my. Okay. Say, they can see my skeptical face because I'm a bit cynical when I look around. What I see. You know the wild community of guitar. You actually already. Referred to this. The, the initial reason reason that triggered you guys thinking and right. you know coming up with this code of ethics but <clears throat> you know looking around 
the our very sort of trendy business or 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 um, profession of guitar makers. There's thousands and thousands of them around the world, whether it's acoustic guitars, yeah. whether it's electric guitars, whatever. Um, our profession that once was very sort of a, a, a rare thing, it sometimes mm. to me feels like there is more guitar makers than guitar players. <laughs> <laughs> in certain <laughs> contexts, okay, that's not true. But anyways, you know, this code of ethics, it's fantastic, but is it real? Is it happening? Or is it, is it a utopia, yeah. a hippie fantasy from, from time long gone? You know, aren't we witnessing an, an era of no compassion and, you know, give me more, more, more and more efficiency and faster and technology and stone cold business and all that? At least I have this feeling sometimes in the electric guitar side of things. I'm I'm noticing a shift. Not everybody, but things have changed. Mm. Uh, I you, you've touched on a lot of things there. You, I'll try and jump in on a few of them. Uh, certainly, yeah. The the number of luthiers of all types nowadays it's 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 exploded yeah. compared to certainly what it was 30, 40 years ago. Yeah. Um, for sure. Uh, so. But it's really just giving lots and lots more options to players, which makes it more competitive for us all. Yeah. However, I'm sure, as you know, no two players want the same thing, whether it's yeah. the feel or the sound. You know, every human is different. And so to me, there's room for everybody. But some of the younger, newer luthiers have to find their market. They've got to find the people who like it the way they're building it. Right? Yeah. Um, but you did touch on a, a, a bunch of things and relating back to Catherine Dudley's book, her subtitle was something about it, artisanal uh, in, in yeah, modern the, times. The, the, or something. En the yeah. endurance of artisanal values in North America. So there you go. And I think she hit on something that's an interesting phenomenon. It's almost like it's happening in concert with our digital age. Yeah, and it's represented by whether it's uh, people buying handmade things, whether it's the guitars or other craft, mm -hmm. um, but they're appreciating it because they're connecting on a on a human level with the people who are doing the work. And there's something that meets, uh, you know, just the need that all humans have to connect mm -hmm. with other people, to have tactile things. All of that is just being human. And I think the artisanal side is waking up and there's a bit of a resurgence for anything tactile. I suppose the average person, you know, or in the music world might say uh, the, the increase in vinyl sales. And even there's this niche that they want cassettes, you know, of yeah. all things. Yeah. Because it's old fashioned. It's more it's more analog than digital. Yeah, it's and tangible. It's, giving, it's tangible. You're right. It's answering something in a human need. Yeah. And I think we are part of that. Although what we're feeling is also related to something you said of the quantity of builders now who are there, who are crowding, crowding our world. Yeah. And I do see that to some degree. Yeah. Um, you know, thankfully, I still have work. But where, how it manifests itself for someone like me and maybe like you is that we still have to show our work out in the world. Yeah. Have to do a show occasionally. And that's why I would come to the Holy Grail shows yeah. and things like that. Or or Woodstock in New York. Because even though I've got yeah, E. G. B. there it is. Yeah. And um <laughs> even though I've got a reputation and a lot of people know about me, there's lots who don't know me. And if they don't see me, they're not even going to be thinking about Laskin guitars. They're going to be responding to who they're seeing right in front of them when they go to these shows or, or yeah. go into a retail shop. So I, I think that's an important aspect. And, and it's not that we're doing something old fashioned. It's that we're doing something that meets a human need. Yeah, that's very well said. That's very well said. Yeah. So people, when you've bought Grit's book and you've fallen in love with <laughs> Grit's work, then it's time to buy Grit's guitar. And I'm I'm his authorized dealer, so <laughs> no, no. <laughs> no, no, I'm not. Yeah, we no, have I'm to not. negotiate your percent. <laughs> no, 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 no. But um, 
seriously, uh, yeah, there is there, there is definitely that that human factor and that tangible element that people seem to be more and more craving after. Some yeah. part of people. Yeah. At the same time, it feels like the 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 you know everything is is expanding. Like mm. you know, the factories are spilling out more guitars than ever. Even if you know, and and so so it's you know it, it's all growing. It's it's sometimes it's for me it's overwhelming. I I don't quite mm. understand, especially on the kind of let's say the, the the cheaper side of 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 mass produced instruments you know where do all those c containers of those guitars where do, where do they go where do they end up yeah. i i don't quite understand the the amounts that you know we have a country here of, of you know 5.5 million people in finland and the amounts of guitars i'm hearing is is sold to to our country every year on another hand of course it's it's wonderful that that at the same time, when when uh, there there is the talk about, especially on the electric guitar side and and uh, the rock music, there's the kind of uh, scandalistic um, titles in, in in magazines that you know rock music is dead and it and it's just you know mm. going away and it's going to be marginalized in the same way as classical music and you know it's for pops and grand pops and. And it's the electronic music and electronic dance, whatever rap music that is is the next or the current current thing. But but I don't quite I don't quite I don't quite buy it that it's going exactly that way. The the way I see it more, and I've talked about it in some other broadcasts of mine, is that we're not maybe seeing such mainstream phenomenons in the modern age as there used to be with the big stars yeah. and and kind of drive that are driving the, the the guitar music forward and and people playing but it's more like fragmented all over the place and the phenomenon exists everywhere it's just that you only know about it if you're into a specific genre and you're following that genre in YouTube in whatever social medias you're follow you know you're 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 in so it's kind of it's like it's a it's a tunnel where you're at you're in and everybody has their own tunnel that looks their own tunnel yeah. and there's not that kind of uh, uh you know i i can't disagree with you for sure that when you look at pop music nowadays it's it's hip hop and rap and and to beats and you know sometimes in the band there's guitar players yeah but it's not the central thing the way it was when first the folk era happened and then the rock and roll era happened and yeah. guitar was immensely critical yeah. to both of those yeah. and it not as critical. But I will say, so yes, it's up and down and maybe we're passing an, an, an ultimate peak. Which is I okay, I, which is okay. That's how it is. Yeah. I, I honestly don't feel it's going to disappear because think about it. In all cultures, first of all, there's so many different types of guitars in the world, and pretty much every culture on the planet included it in their traditional or their native music, not just their popular forms. But the guitar is the only instrument that gives you bass and treble at the same time, but it's portable. Yeah. Whereas the piano, <laughs> the only other instrument that can do that. And so, okay, you can you can drag a keyboard around. What about accordion? Guitar... Accordion. Yeah. A comment okay, about an accordion. accordion can do it, but come on, accordions. <laughs> now, come on. I love accordions and concertinas, but not in the same way. And I think because it's so portable, that's why the guitar has become so popular. That it can do more than any instrument, different styles and everything. And so, yes, it may wax and wane in its popularity, but it ain't going away. It's just too convenient. Yeah. Yeah. That's my belief. Yeah. Okay, people, we are closing to the end of this. So we're we're wrapping up. It is soon 10 p.m. in Finland. It's 3 p.m. in Toronto. Is that correct? Oh, oh yeah, almost. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. yeah. So we're wrapping up. I think we covered a lot of ground. We didn't cover one third of my notes, which I knew would happen. But... Um, 
you know, the brainstormers will continue in the coming weeks. And uh, <laughs> when I'm talking with, with, with other people uh, in the business, other sites, other facets of the business. So, great, I can't express my gratitude. You wanted to join. I'm so happy. This was fun. Ah. Yeah, it, it always a pleasure to do anything with you, you know. All you have to do is ask. I'm there. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Okay. okay, and uh you have a you have a day ahead. You're continuing to work. Yeah. Yeah. And you're gonna have yeah. a nightcap and go to bed. Right? Yeah, exactly. Something like that. So <laughs> Okay. Farewell and, and until next time. Talk to you soon. Hopefully sooner than okay. later. Yeah, let's plan for a next time. Yes. Let's do another we'll do conversation. That. Yeah, we do that. Okay. 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 Ciao. Take care. Take care. Stay safe. Bye. Okay. You too. Bye. Okay, now how do I leave this? <laughs> I think <laughs> I'm trying to leave also. I'm I'm trying to kick you out. Wait, the camera's not working. No. <laughs> no. Now he now he went. Oh man. What a wonderful person. <clears throat> Remember I told you in the last episode what that, you know, guitar makers are good people. Well, you have just met one of the very best. And before <clears throat> I start all weeping in front of the camera. Um in the next episode, we'll continue on the same topic. Factory versus Luthier. Does it make a difference to the player? I have a different different guest. I will be interviewing another good friend, another god of fretted instruments. Ladies and gentlemen, let me show you a picture of him. It's somewhere. <laughs> Here he is, ladies and gentlemen, John Page. Um, I'm terrified. Let me take that out. <laughs> yeah, John worked over um, two decades for Fender, 12 years of which as a co-founder and the head of the Fender Custom Shop. And then fast forward in 2006, John Page Guitars was born. You know, John Page, a heavy duty living legend from the side of the electric guitars, he has experienced firsthand both sides of our story, the factory, the luthier. Mm. So I'm excited, how about you? And if you know someone who might find this video helpful, who might be interested in, in, in watching the next interview with John Page, you know, please share on your own social media channels, on guitar forums where people benefit watching this. You know, like, dislike, however you feel. You know the drill. Um, and leave your comments below. Subscribe to our channel. So that's a wrap. Stay safe. Very nice of so many of you been with us live today and... Um, Keep on leaving those comments below. Um, I'm always, and my wife Emma is always, we're, we're browsing through the comments and collecting if there's questions you want to ask. If there are interesting questions, we will get back to those in the next episode. So, you know, it's fun. So that's a wrap. Stay safe. Look after your loved ones and yourself. Remember, peace, love, good music. Those will take us far. Until next week. Factory versus Luthier. John Page versus U.R. Rokangas. See you then. <laughs>